Hello everyone and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Europe, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals across the continent. I'm Jean-Marc Lim and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning in into this half-year special broadcasting series. Today, we will explore how the AI revolution is cha changing the market and how the, to chart new frontiers in European data centers. The primary focus will revolve around the burgeoning growth and innovative revenue streams within the European data center sector, while spotlighting the central role and unprecedented impact of AI on these critical infrastructures. And with that said, we're going to jump right in, and it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest today, Mark Prestrich, Executive Vice President and General Manager for Telehouse. Uh, and Mark, it's a pleasure speaking to you and seeing you again. Um, it's been a very busy season so far. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Good to, good to see you again, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's a super busy time at the moment, as, uh, as I'm sure we'll get into. There's a, there's a huge amount um, driving change within our industry, so a hugely exciting time, but a very busy time as well. So uh, good time to chat, I think. I was going to say before we jump into the the topic of today, maybe just give a bit of context to our to our listeners. Uh, could you just explain a little bit more what Telehouse does, who's backing you, um, and then your role as well within the organisation? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, so Telehouse is um, is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, KDDI. So KDI is, um, I think, the fourth largest company in Japan and focused very much on the ICT or uh, managed services segment. There are about 40,000 people in KDDI. Telehouse is the data center arm or brand um, of KDDI. So as I say, we're, we're wholly owned. We have operations in 14 countries across the world. Uh, we were established in 1988, uh, first location in Staten Island in New York, and then we opened in, uh, in the Docklands in London in uh, 1989, so uh, 35 years ago. Uh, my role is very much working for Telehouse Europe, so I'm responsible for uh, the customer journey across uh, their experience with us from the moment they start looking into our services through their um, onboarding um, through and through their life cycle with us. So, so my job is making sure that we're looking after our customers and give them a, a unique experience. And I've been with the organization for about five and a half years now, so uh, yeah, exciting times. So you've seen a lot of transformational change, we've gone through the, the edge. Uh, the, the the edge buzzword but now we have a bigger buzzword we have ai yeah absolutely um, and i i think it's really interesting actually because when we when we first set up in uh 1989 we were looking at half a kilowatt or less per footprint and uh and then we've gone through uh cloud and edge as you say uh and now we're looking at ai and that's moving the dial to a completely different level no we, we, it's i mean it, it depends on what you look at, but some people say it's 10 times, 100 times, 500 times more, 1,000 times more. So, I mean, I, I guess my first question could actually be more of an umbrella kind of question into the industry itself. What do you think are the opportunities and especially the challenges associated with such a massive shift uh, that we are witnessing on the continent? Yeah, I think I think the opportunities kind of fall into two categories. I think from a an operational point of view, there is a, a great opportunity for us to embrace uh, AI to make sure we're managing our DCs more effectively and efficiently. So making sure that we're having our plant running at optimum levels. So using AI to, uh, to to turn down equipment when we need to or turn up equipment when we need to. So thinking about things like the chillers and so on and so forth, things around lighting uh, and also around automating some of the um, the decision making about um, capacity, future capacity, what what constraints there are and what we'll need to do but also from an employee perspective it, it we can act we can we can uh, use ai to do some of the more manual and repetitive tasks which means that uh, our kind of personnel can focus more on on interesting stuff and look at career development and all those kind of good things so i think really from an, uh, a data center operational point of view is that there's a huge amount i think um from a customer demand perspective obviously that's cu driving customer demand because customers are now looking for third-party co-location or uh, wholesale data centers to to host these kind of applications they can't they don't have the facility or the skill sets to be able to host them in-house so they're looking at people such as ourselves and the wider industry to to, to do that um, in terms of the challenges obviously one of the biggest challenges uh, is around where do we find the power to to drive not only the power that these racks need now or driven by ai and machine learning but also how do we call them so power availability is one of the key, the key challenges that we're facing across uh, across the industry particularly in some of the larger metros you know we talk a lot about the flat d markets and the constraints on power there so there is a definitely some challenges around finding power in the in the major metros and that's leading to opportunities in and i guess what we call the second tier cities as well hmm. uh, i mean I, i've got a few follow-up questions there i think we'll go into the yep. second tier in a second but just yep. quickly on um building speculatively because um we were talking about customer demand uh, and all that there's been a few conversations lately around 
build speculatively anymore, not like we used to even five, ten years ago. Um, put some money on the ground and wait for the customers to come. Is that not happening anymore? Is that what you're seeing in the market as well? It's really now really just driven by anchor tenants. Um, and are we able to keep up with demand? I think um, I think so. We, we're very much focused, yeah, on the on the retail sector rather than wholesale. So I think we are. Whilst we're not, um, whilst we are not building speculatively, we do see a, a runway through to the mid twenty um, thirties, effectively. So we have, we believe, we'll have enough capacity to take us through to the, to the kind of mid twenty thirties. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is around not so much um, the demand, but what type of demand that will be, um, and. Mm -hmm. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but it, it, what is the demand? Is it around traditional kind of um, values? Is it around, um, you know, 35 kilowatts a rack? Or are we talking about stuff that's going to affect immersion cooling 100 kilowatts plus? So so that's the biggest challenge about how do we build and design those data centers for, for future demand? I don't think, I think there's any doubt that, that we'll see, continue to see increased demand. It's just what that demand looks like and when that will happen. I mean, there's a lot of talk about things like immersion cooling at the moment, but are, are any people deploying in anger now or are you looking two, three years down the line? And, and that's what we've got to think of because with construction at the moment, it takes 18 months, two years to build a facility, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and two years right now, it's a, it's a long time. I mean, we've, exactly. we've seen the, exactly. the, we've seen the tip of the iceberg, I guess, with, uh, with chat GPT, uh, which yep. requires a massive amount of, uh, of data processing. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. just the tip of the iceberg, probably the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. What's happening and what's coming. So that, that's going to be interesting. I guess then if we look into secondary markets, then what, what would you say are the geographies that kind of attract more attention at the moment, um, especially from a power availability? Yeah, I think from I think the way we see it, we see um, we see areas such as um, Lisbon in Portugal is is an interesting one. Uh, I think Warsaw, uh, the Nordics, obviously, um, Madrid, and Barcelona in Spain, um, and then it, as a further part of our portfolio, we're looking at in Southeast Asia around markets like Bangkok and Indonesia uh, and other areas around that. So, so certainly in Europe, where those are the second tier markets. And I think from a specifically UK perspective, um, with the, the challenges around London, we're looking at other yeah. other metros, you know, outside London, whether that's Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, those kind of kind of kind of areas as well. Yeah. I guess the challenge there is that all of these applications, they need interconnection. So they somehow got to connect back to the internet connection hubs in the main metros anyway. So that will pose another challenge. Yeah. It, it is about the ecosystem. Um, it's about having mm, those exactly. really need is having the fiber built, um, and then in, for data centers specifically, it's also about having all the piping done, um, sewage, electric, electric grids, and all those sort of things coming together. Um, exactly right. Yeah. Created the the gold pot at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess so. And then when we look into this whole transformation AI is bringing upon us, what would you say would be or are some of the new revenue streams coming into the data center space? Um, how can we make money beyond what we already did for the last twenty years? Uh, I, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a really difficult one, and one we we kind of grapple with at the moment. You I think to share too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I well I think you know if you if you take an a, a extreme example, if you look at um, I guess at immersion cooling as an example, then obviously there's a there's a different paradigm. You're talking about you know, from a, um, a who's going to manage that equipment, who's going to be responsible for the maintenance of that equipment. Do um, data center companies have the, the skills and the resources to be able to, to manage that equipment? Because I think most companies are looking for an end-to-end -end solution. In, in other words, they don't want one, one contract with a data center company, another one with the immersion technology company. They want a kind of end-to-end solution, don't they? So I think that does pr produce a, uh, a definite opportunity to, to increase revenue. Uh, but it also provides some challenges in terms of um, skill sets, and availability, resource, all those kind of kind of good things as well. Hmm. Um, but I think that's uh, that's something that's really uh, at, what, what we're really at the forefront of our minds at the moment is is how can we make sure that we give that customer the best experience, make it as easy as possible to transact, make it easy as possible to operate, and, and but it will drive new revenue streams for us. I'm absolutely hmm. sure. Hmm. Okay, and then I mean, I, I would ask you: Are you worried about any of the impact the AI might have? Um, in the market, this is not a telehouse question. In the market overall, mm. so we're talking about things like sustainability, workforce. Um, that is a bit worried about vacancies and jobs. Um, even on the days in the side, it's, it's a bit more technical, so we still need some humans. But is there anything that worries you about all this? I think. Um, I think it's. I, I think there's two ways to answer that question. I think firstly, we're never never quite sure what what the future iterations of AI are going to be and what the what the 
opportunities they're going to create. I think from a from our perspective, we we're looking at it very much as an opportunity at the moment. As I say, I think there's a lot of kind of manual and repetitive tasks that happen within data centers. So if we can uh, if we can get our AI to take on some of those, and if, even if we move into the world of robotics and so on, we, if we take that away from um, from human beings, then we do open up the opportunity for human beings to do more interesting things, to spend more time talking to customers and partners, um, to drive a better customer experience and give them more job satisfaction as well. Um, and I think there's also, there is a, um, as, as, as a different point, there is a definitely a skill shortage with our industry, which is well documented. And, and maybe AI can help with that in terms of making sure that we are, you know, the, as I say, the manual repetitive tasks are handled by, by AI and machine learning. But, but the, the more interesting tasks will, will attract more people to our industry and make people stay within our industry. So I think largely we see it as an opportunity, but the, uh, the future is, uh, it's also, it's a little bit unnerving and we know, don't quite know what the future state is going to look like. And that's always a, uh, a challenge and keeps you awake at night sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and, and I think it's also worth pointing that this is not um, exclusive to this industry. It's, ex it's exactly right. Industry, it's the same. Business in general. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was watching some videos yesterday about uh, how in Hollywood they're still thinking about this um, and how this is going to affect them. And they don't still don't, they have no idea how things are going to change in terms of acting yeah. rights and copyrights and image cop image copyrights, your own voice, all those sort of things. So this is happening everywhere and there's yeah. no answers or there's no straight answers at the moment. No. Um, and then going back into the data center, and you've kind of already touched on this as well, but in the actual building, you, you've touched on this a little bit with, uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the cooling, the different requirements of the architecture. But how, instead of being a, an interesting question, I'm going to ask you about telehouse. How is telehouse adapting the buildings um, to this new wave of uh, heavier equipment, more water, which usually water with electrics, in our mind, we always think yeah. it's not a good idea, but of course now it is a good idea. It's a viable option. So how yeah. does the building change? How is, how is telehouse real estate changing to accommodate all this? Yeah, I think another great question and um, and one again, which we, we throw, we've thrown around a lot and we'll continue to throw around a lot. I think from a, from a new build perspective, I think the key for us is to have solutions that um, can adapt and be flexible and suit every uh, every type of um, density requirement. So whether that means that the, the lower parts of your building, you have reinforced floors to do your immersion cooling, moving up through direct to chip rear door heat exchange, and then having other floors available for your traditional type um, air uh, cooled facilities. I think that's that's exactly what we're looking at. So you need to have, I think way we're looking at is different floors or different areas within floors to cope with different demands, because I think it's, it's definitely not going to be a one size fits all. There's definitely going to be a demand for 100 kilowatts plus per rack in three, five years time. But I think there's still going to be a demand for your traditional type um, air cool type uh, mm. type deployments at 10 to 12. So you've got to be able to cater for all of that. So that adds some complexity around how you design the building. Um, one of the things that we're thinking about is do you do you need as much uh, as much as many square meters for um, to, to deliver the, the same amount of power? Probably not because uh, you're going to have a lot of high density stuff. So all those things kind of kind of play in our thoughts at the moment. And of course, when you're building a, a data center or you're constructing or designing one, as you said earlier, it's going to be two years till it's uh, till it's open. But it's going to be in service for you know eight to ten years after that and what are going to be the demands in 2032 2033 so that's why the key is having having the flexibility i think uh, around that and in terms of your existing data center footprint you know i think that's that's a real challenge we are potentially looking at some areas where we can retrofit some existing data centers to cater for for current demand um but again the key challenge around the high density um piece is around your, your kind of floor loading so a lot of the buildings that were built 25 30 years ago can't cope with that so there's a, a lot of work you have to do to kind of reinforce floors and uh and other areas to make sure you were fit for purpose so definitely a lot lot to be thinking about but i think as long as you have a flexible agile a portfolio of services and products to suit every type of density. I think you'll be be well placed. Hmm. At what point, when you look into a thirty-five year old building, at what point do you decide, you know what, this is not fit for purpose. Let's divest this and go somewhere else. <laughs> the, the, I mean, we, we are getting to that phase. We, we've seen some some guys doing that. I mean, we've no one to mission competitors, but we've seen Equinix doing that. We've seen Digital Realty um, yeah. doing some of that stuff as well, and in London especially. Um, so, yeah, at what yeah. point? Does an operator get into that phase of like, right? We might as well just divest. I can I can completely understand that if um, if you uh, if you're not a connectivity hub, um, and 
whether you're a carrier hotel or an interconnection hub, or whatever the, the, the terminology is these days. I think our, uh, we certainly aren't looking at that, Jao, because we have in Telehouse North and in Voltaire in Paris, we have the most interconnected buildings in London and Paris, respectively. Uh, I don't think um, uh, divesting those assets is, uh, is anything we even begin to think about. You know, we have mm. to think of a way uh, to make those buildings more sustainable whilst still uh, enabling the ecosystem that allows our customers to connect to kind of service providers, ASPs, CDNs, uh, IXPs, all those kind of things. Because we, we just can't, you know, can you imagine if we said to to, to our customers, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we're going to uh, divest this asset well. or we're going to knock <laughs> it down. I think there'd be absolute uproar and uh, and the internet <laughs> might stop working. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that's, I can understand that from a wholesale perspective. I really, really understand that. But from a, an interconnection or retail perspective, it's just not viable. So we we have to find ways to, to make those buildings more sustainable and more uh, relevant for, for future demand. <laughs> Well, at least you'll be breaking the internet, not with selfish, hopefully with something a bit more substantial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then, Mike, so I guess one, one of the final topics that we'll touch on today as well is regulation. I mean, we are, mm. um, th this is a tremendous year when it comes to politics and things passing mm. through governments and legislation houses and all those sort of things. Um, what regulation keeps you, I'm not going to ask awake at night, but what, what regulation are you keeping an eye on? The most, um, especially because you do have an European wide portfolio. But, uh, I mean, yeah. you can point into a country and there's something happening there. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And I think, um, I think for us, I think we, we, a lot of it's around um, sustainability. So, and I think we, we, we embrace that as well. I think we have an obligation and duty as data center operators to, to run our businesses in more sustainable ways. So, um, being part of the, uh, climate neutral data center pact is really important for us but it does give us some challenges in, in, in how we operate and then i think um um aside from sustainability i think um the uh all the the regulations around the financial services industry and the enhanced regulations there in terms of audit and data protection are really um are really things we've got to think about and also uh, in terms of ai i mean there's uh, we're only beginning to get the uh the legislation and regulation around ai aren't we so it'd be interesting to see how that how that spins out as we as we move forward but mm -hmm. but but a lot to be thinking about and and of course you know a lot of our customers are are um impacted by these regulations as well and we as a, a third party and sometimes a provider of kind of scope three missions to look at it in a sustainability perspective so we're really important it's really important that we uh, we embrace it yeah it's preparedness um and exactly about uh, preparedness can you give us a, a roadmap for the next 12 months um what we are going to be cutting throughout the continent yeah, so we, um, we, it's a really exciting time for us at, at the moment. And um, we are about to um, open 5.4 uh, megawatts in, in Docklands in the summer um, in our kind of telehouse facility, which uh, which is the legacy Thompson Royce's building, which we acquired a few years back. Um, so we're opening 5.4 megawatts there in the summer. And then 18 months to two years after that, we'll open a further uh, 5.4 megawatts. So so from a London perspective, it's uh, it, it's looking very, uh, very good. We're also looking at uh, expanding in Frankfurt um, on the same campus that we are at the moment, uh, also in uh, in Paris and Marseille. So those are the, the markets that we really, we, we've got earmarked for expansion. Uh, and then any, any further kind of um, opportunities we see to to, to to grow into new markets and uh, you probably saw last last year we acquired a company in uh, Canada um, allied to run to, uh, in Canada we um, we acquired three buildings um, from a company called allied so we're always looking at opportunities where we can can grow our kind of portfolio that fits in with um, with, with uh, our kind of interconnection or retail type scenario in fact I thought I think I saw you in Canada you were there when structure research event is that right uh, yes no, it's, uh, mm -hmm. So September, October, October last year. Yeah, October, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be going again to, to the event Vegas, in Vegas this year, though, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah, going to be very interesting. It's very um, different and to Toronto. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there'll be a different vibe to it, but uh, I, I've heard good things about who's registering, so I'm, I'm sure yeah, be yeah, a, looks good. A bigger, more curated audience. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, yeah. But uh, Mike, best reason we'll be here watching your green and brown field investments over the next year. Right. But uh, Mark, thanks so much for talking to me. Um, this was really useful, uh, no, not just for me, but also to the audience. Um, and that's all that we have time for today. And on behalf of the JSA, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You can watch our two out of half year sessions on JSA's LinkedIn and YouTube pages, one discussing data sovereignty, AI and sustainability, and the other one looking at hyperscale data center development in Europe. 
With that, we wrap up today's conversation from me and the team at JSA Europe. We hope you have a great summer. See you next time. And as always, happy networking.